think. Thank you, Lise. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Whitney Calkins for our guests here for the Laura Mann Integrative Healthcare Lecture Series, which is held during Family Medicine Grand Rounds. And I just want to share a little bit about the Laura Mann Integrative Healthcare Lecture Series. Laura Mann was um, a home birth nurse midwife who served her patients with great compassion and love. And when she became ill with stage four breast cancer, she thrived by integrating Western therapies with complementary and integrative um, medical therapies. And she was seen really as a visionary and started the first integrative healthcare center in Vermont, um, right in Burlington. And, um, and back in 2015, the Laura Mann Center for Integrative Health merged with UVM Integrated Health, um, which is in the College of Nursing at UVM. And you know, to honor her legacy, this endowed healthcare lecture series was created. And um, now I collaborate, collaborate with Kara Feldman Hunt, and she brings us a variety of you know really incredible speakers. And this morning I want to introduce our two speakers. Um, who are visiting us from Texas, is where they're located right now. So first is Dr. Sherrod Coley. He is a family physician who has dedicated, um, who has dedicated his career to advancing <laughs> equity. He has spent almost two decades working with federally qualified health centers in both urban and rural uh, settings in California and Texas. He is currently medical director of the Integrative Pain Management Program at People's Community Clinic and FQHC in Austin, Texas. Presenting along with Dr. Coley is Karen, uh, sorry, Keegan Warren Clem, who uh, JD LLM. <laughs> she is a senior consultant with Health Management Associates where she provides input on health equity matters through civil justice lens. She's a former senior managing attorney and Keegan has more than a decade of experience in developing, integrating and evaluating medical legal partnerships, which embed attorneys and paralegals with healthcare teams to mitigate social determinants of health. Through this national model, Keegan has worked collaboratively with healthcare providers serving the lifespan to improve outcomes by bringing patient-centered legal and structural expertise into all aspects of the delivery of healthcare. There is more to say, but I'm going to go ahead and let our two speakers begin their presentation. I'm really pleased to have you here. Thank you so much for coming. Hey, uh, thank you so much, Whitney, and, and thank you for having us. Um, we're gonna put the slides up now. Can you guys see those? Yes, okay, great. So um, <clears throat> yeah, we're really excited to be here. Um, Keegan and I are today are gonna talk about the concept of integrative health equity uh, and specifically how our clinic, <clears throat> People's Community Clinic strives to put that concept into action. Uh, we do it by working at multiple levels to help improve the health and, of, of patients in the community. Uh, and we're gonna talk more about this in this hour. Uh, just of note, we have no relevant financial relationships to disclose. All right, so uh, who are we? Well, People's Community Clinic was originally a free clinic that started over 50 years ago by volunteer doctors and nurses in a church basement to take care of students and others who didn't have access to healthcare. Um, it grew and expanded to become, uh, to, to, and began to care for an increasing number of working Central Texas families. Uh, in 2012, we became a federally qualified health center. Uh, our clinic is a patient-centered medical home, uh, but also a community-centered health, health home, meaning we recognize that most of health happens outside of the four walls of the health center. Uh, so we work in both the clinic and the community to improve health outcomes. Now on the right, you can see our new building that we moved into in uh, 2016, so I guess it's not new anymore. Uh, in 2020, we served over 18,000 unique patients, 85% uh, of which identified as Hispanic or Latinx. And 63% of our patients prefer another language, mainly Spanish. 41% uh, of our patients are on Medicaid or CHIP, while almost half, including most of our adult patients, are uninsured. And you have to remember that Texas still has not uh, expanded Medicaid. So <clears throat> what is this concept, integrative health equity, that we're going to be talking about today? Um, so I'm a co-founder of the national nonprofit Integrative Medicine for the Underserved. Uh, I am for us, as it's known, it's a collaborative, multidisciplinary organization committed to culturally responsive 
accessible, integrative healthcare for all. The driving force behind the organization is the advancement of health equity, with the belief that integrative health is one of the best tools we have for that purpose. One of the people I worked closely with on the board of I Am For Us uh, was a, a researcher from UCSF named Maria Chow. <clears throat> Maria and her, her collaborator, collaborator Shelley Adler, uh, who you can see in the top corner, uh, in 2018 wrote a paper specifically dis dis discussing this idea. Uh, in fact, Maria and Shelley have created a multidisciplinary training program for integrative health professionals focused on research in this area. Adler and Chow suggest leveraging integrative health to advance health equity, the highest level of health for all people. Uh, integrative health is excellent at building resilience and patient self-efficacy, and it can help with chronic stress and trauma, which is prevalent in underserved populations. Uh, integrative health can lead to better health outcomes, and despite what some people may think of it, can actually be low cost and easily accessible, especially when you think of things like uh, nutrition, exercise, mind body, herbs, acupuncture, homeopathy, these are all pretty low cost and, um, for, for folks. Um, currently, integrative health is primarily being used uh, by well-to-do white folks, uh, but many integrative health modalities actually come from communities of color. Now, these medicines like acupuncture, yoga, herbalism, midwifery, uh, et cetera, in this country have been appropriated and commodified, and as a result have excluded many of the groups that created and utilized this medicine to begin with. But if we can reclaim it and make it more accessible, integrative health approaches actually can provide culturally relevant care to many underserved communities. Uh, in order to do this, though, we need to uphold the values of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Integrative health needs to better understand its, its biases, and the field needs to support diverse patients, which means having more diverse practitioners, staff, and learners. Uh, there are organizations that are working on this, including I Am For Us, uh, POCA, which is the People's Organization of Community Acupuncture, and even the American Public Health Association in their Integrative, Complementary, and Traditional Health Practices section. Now, it's not enough to just provide this care in clinic. We know the majority of health is determined by upstream factors. Policies of holding racism, discrimination, and poverty lead to a lack of access to healthcare, healthy foods, housing, transportation, or other social needs which impact health. When we talk about integrative health, we talk about addressing root causes. So integrative health should encompass a broader definition. As we'll discuss, addressing these upstream determinants should be part of the new paradigm. This requires a multi-level pro approach that we'll demonstrate, and this approach will help us move towards health equity and justice. Okay, so what we're going to do right now is we're going to show you a, a quick video. It's, it's essentially a case study. And then we're going to break you all out into breakout groups of four. And then we're going to have some discussion about this. So uh, well, let's we'll watch the video. So pay attention to what's going on in the video because you're going to be uh, asked questions, a uh, question about this uh, in a few minutes. And then we'll, 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 we'll discuss, discuss the prompt after the video. My name is Fred Blackman. I'm a minister at New Life Austin, and I'm also on the board of directors here at People's Community Clinic. As a minister, I do several things from teaching classes to visiting people in hospitals and nursing homes to, of course, preaching sermons. I became a patient at People's Community Clinic after a stay in St. Davis Hospital. I was in the shower getting ready for work, and I felt a sharp pain in my back and then my legs collapsed from underneath me. I was rushed to the hospital uh, where they uh, determined that I had a slip disc shoot out and hit my spinal cord. After about five surgeries and several other pr procedures, I was released. Uh, during that time, I lost my job and I lost my insurance. And uh, the doctor who released me recommended that I come to People's Community Clinic for my follow-up. When I first met Fred, he had just come out of the hospital. He had a, some severe back pain. He went in the hospital. Nine months later, he came out having to learn how to walk. Um, he had to learn how to speak so his words weren't slurred. So he was, he was depressed. He was unsure of which way to go. When I arrived here, my life had basically been flipped upside down. Um, I had always been strong. I was a runner. I was an athlete. And in an instant, all of that ended. And People's Community Clinic really, really helped get my life back on track. For patients who have complex needs, I think we really take a team approach and an interdisciplinary.
primary approach. We have a whole array. All right. All right, great. So that, that's Fred, you met Fred now. Um, and so <clears throat> we're gonna break out into groups of four and we're gonna recommend that in your group, you have a spokesperson who may be willing to share ideas from the group. We're gonna give you four minutes and we want you, then we're gonna come back to the larger group and have a little bit of discussion. And we want you to kind of think about this right here, this question, knowing this patient's clinical history, Fred, and the current situation and taking an integrative health equity approach uh, identify the, the, the patient's barriers to wellness. What should we do to help ad address these barriers? And we recognize we've only given you like one slide so far on integrative health equity. So you don't really, maybe may not understand it completely, but we're just kind of curious to see where you're all at right now around these concepts. And we just want to start the discussion before we d dive into it deeper. So, so, we're, uh, so Keegan's going to help us break into groups of four right now. Uh, and then we'll give you four minutes. Uh, every, everyone, anyone have any questions? Are everyone clear about this? Okay. And so, uh, and we'll, and so we'll, we'll, we'll break you out here in a second. I think it should just pop up at the bottom where you'll then just uh, click join breakout group and you should be able to do that then. Okay, so look like people are moving into the breakout rooms now? Yeah, okay, great. And uh, Keegan, are we, are you, are you, did you set up where we're going into the breakout rooms or? I did not, uh, it should be everybody. Okay, yeah, I was invited. I didn't know if I, we should yes. go you know, I don't think we have to, no. Yeah, we'll, we'll stay out here, okay. All right, I'm gonna, should I start the clock? Yes. Okay. Is there a way to, Keegan, is there a way to like, just put the, um, I have the question, how do I put it so they can see it in the breakout room? You can do a broadcast message to all. Do you see okay. that? Where is that? Yeah. Like? I've actually already done um, it. Oh, you did? Okay. <laughs> He's on top of it. <laughs> awesome. Just for my reference, where is broadcast message for all? It's the it's person under. who... Oh, only the person who does the breakout rooms could do that. You also can set a timer in there. So if you wanted four minutes, you could actually set it so that it's four minutes long and then they have like 60 seconds to come back to the main room. Okay, that's good to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's amazing what a couple of years of teaching in this format will do. <laughs> you get very creative. Absolutely, right? <laughs> I can also see that some of your folks didn't join a room, so they're still in the main room. Don't know how that happened, but I guess I, they didn't hit the join button. Yeah, I can assign folks. You don't have to assign me. I'd... Oh, sorry. I was just, just assigning everyone that I saw. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's just another minute or so, about a minute and 10. So I think it's probably okay, okay. at this point. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, you can, you can uh, 
it's yeah we have one minute exactly right now so I sent that message. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hi, this is Kelly. I didn't join the room. I did get an invite. I just wanted to let you know I had to get my kids out the door for school. So that's why I didn't join the room. <laughs> <laughs> Understandable. I'm having a similar issue. Yeah. Okay. Sure, let me know when that minute counts down and I yep. will close the rooms. Yeah, we got uh, 20 seconds left. <clears throat> All right, time. I have closed the breakout rooms. <clears throat> So let me know when everyone seems like they're back in. I would also ask everyone to mute themselves as they come back in. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Do we seem like we have most people back now? Um, wait, just another okay. 10 seconds or so. You can yeah, see, sure. if you look under the participants, you'll see how many people are back in. And you had over 100, and you're only at 36. So they're oh, all coming okay. back. All right. In. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. I don't yeah. see that participant. So in 15 seconds, Sherrod, it's going to force them all back. Oh, I see. OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. There we go. There we go. Good. All right. That. All right. There. Okay. Welcome back. So um, we're gonna um, let you guys kind of discuss this a little bit and uh, have a couple, maybe three or two, three or four people talk. Uh, does anyone want to uh, sort of address this question uh, that we that we post, y'all? Feel free to unmute yourself and just, just start talking or raise your hand, whichever you prefer. Okay, I see Jessica. Dun, dun, Jessica. Good morning. Our group discussed a couple of different factors. One was access to food, um, food insecurity assessment. Uh, in addition to that, thinking through any sort of implicit bias that Fred might feel by accessing such types of programs. Um, from hierarchy of needs, in addition to food, we thought about, you know, his whole life shifted. He would, you know, can he drive? Does he have other people in his household, you know, partner, children? Uh, thinking through that financial piece, not just for health insurance purposes, but, you know, does he have secure housing? Uh, what does that look like for him? And um, I think I'm missing something. We didn't even throw in COVID. That's what one of my partners said at the end. Like, what about COVID factors onto this? And uh, his identity shift too, right? Like nine months hospitalized and coming out of there with no longer being employed, uh, his sense of meaning, his sense of purpose, and, and looking at it from his social emotional health. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, you guys dove into a lot of it. That's, that's great. So thinking about uh, some of these social needs, um, social support, the financial pieces, um, and then in identity and, and personal needs, so interpersonal needs as well. So that's great. Thank you. Um, anyone else would li like to share? Uh, I see Sue. Hi. Hi. Yeah, so we talked about um, a lot of the sort of practical things like um, now he's facing follow up care and he has no insurance. And so he was lucky that he had your clinic to go to, but what would happen to him if he was here in Vermont? So and then also just just being discharged from the hospital, facing all the stressors of the bills that are going to be behind him and ahead of him. Um, and now, you know, hopefully he'll be able to get onto a Medicaid or some other form of public assistance, but who's gonna help him navigate that? Um, 
and and all the all the um the depression piece and how that would factor into him being able to access the care that he wants to to get and now he's facing a chronic pain situation too and so the long term effects of his road to recovery how is he going to access um different therapies and modalities that are going to help him on that journey as well yeah that's great that's great to think about these things okay yeah and the insurance we see yeah exactly like uh as I mentioned, no Medicaid expansion in Texas. So it makes it makes it challenging when you just fall fall right off of insurance, private insurance. Um, okay, uh, maybe we'll uh, take uh, one or two more. Anyone else? And if not, it's okay. I'll give a couple more seconds. Sir. One more person wants to chime in. Yeah, we Talk. Uh, this is Terry. We talked uh, here a little bit about um, his rapid descent to uh, poor health, and that uh, he had a, uh, a herniated disc. And somehow, it, it seems like he bypassed physical therapy and six weeks of uh, of conservative therapy, and immediately uh, was uh, into multiple surgeries. So within just a few months, he had gone from being um, from being somebody who had a very common problem uh, to someone who's now a failed back syndrome. And we wondered, uh, you know, he's black. Uh, did he get the kind of care that uh, you and I might get? And that is a, a thoughtful approach to handling a, a very common problem conservatively. Or did maybe he get rushed in through surgery uh, because of other reasons? And uh, so I'm wondering if that may have been one of his barriers to, to good care is that, uh, was he taken advantage of? Uh, there's lots of other therapies that could have been tried that we didn't hear about in his case um, that may not have been used. Right, so maybe some implicit biases or some other, other things at play there. So yeah, okay, thank you. All right, and I think someone else did have their hand up earlier. We can give them that opportunity if they still want us to talk. If not, it's okay. Oh, there it is, uh, Susan Whitman. Yeah, the other thing I think about is being able to sit down. We can sit here and try to figure out what he needs, but having someone to sit down with him and say, what is it that you need in your life? Helping him redefine his meaning, aspiration, purpose, and life, and all of those things that are important for him, because it's probably likely going to be changing, and just being able to sit down and say, what do you need the most right now? Yeah, that's great. Like, what matters to you? That's uh, that's that's a big big theme that we're we're moving towards. So that's that's great. So, thank you all. This is this is great. We've got some great input from you all. You guys are already thinking in, in the right frame of mind there. So that's great. So this will be good as we move forward there. So, okay. So we're gonna we're gonna shift gears, move forward a little bit, um, and and talk uh, now now about uh, just get dive into it a little bit more. So, so yeah, so you heard from Fred, uh, who has chronic pain, is a patient in our integrative pain management program. Uh, we're going to use this, uh, we call it the IPMP, uh, and, and what it was initially built for, which is to address chronic pain and mitigate opioid prescribing as our lens to demonstrate the concept of integrative health equity, since health, integrative health has so much it can offer these complex patients. Now, most of the talk on the news is about the opioid epidemic, but actually what we have in this country is a syndemic or synergistic epidemic. Uh, the aggregation of two or more concurrent or sequential epidemics, which exacerbate the prognosis of, and burden of disease. Now, this is a slide for, just from a couple of years ago from a half dozen sources created by Dr. Bob Twillman, the longtime president of the Academy of Integrative Pain Management, which shows the impact of opioid abuse, uh, which was exacerbated by opioid prescribing unscrupulously encouraged by the pharmaceutical industry as a means of addressing chronic pain, which is the second epidemic there. But it also shows we have a significant mental health issues in this country, which leads to real emotional pain and people often self-medicating. And what we have to remember is that is what, what ties all of this together. Uh, we actually have a crisis of trauma in this country. So, so Keegan and I give a lot of talks about our IPMP. Uh, so most of the discussion surrounds the ideas of chronic pain and substance use, but I think these concepts apply to any chronic condition. Uh, one of the most important things for us to understand in our clinic is that a large majority of our patients have experienced trauma in some shape or form. Our pain program is essentially a complex trauma program. Trauma is the root. The things we see in our clinics are just symptoms. Uh, substance use disorder is a symptom, physical or emotional pain are symptoms, uh, hypertension, diabetes, et cetera. Uh, we know this from ACE studies, which uh, showed that people who have experienced multiple adverse childhood experiences, such as divorce, 
sexual or physical abuse, loss of a family member, incarceration or deportation of a parent, homelessness, et cetera, have higher rates of chronic diseases such as diabetes, hypertension, and cancer, as well as increased substance use disorder, chronic pain, and mental health conditions. Um, unfortunately, one problem with looking at ACEs on their own is that it puts too much of a focus on the individual, which can feel blaming, without understanding what actually leads to this sort of trauma. Dr. Wendy Ellis from George Washington University came up with this brilliant model called the Pair of ACEs. And this is a foundation for her Building Community Resilience Collaborative, which you can learn more about at the link at the bottom. What it states is that we have to look at the community conditions, or as she pulls, puts it, the adverse community environments that increase the risks of those particular traumatic events. These are things like racism, discrimination, poverty, lack of economic opportunity, violence, including gun violence or state-sponsored violence. Uh, I like this because it's trying to look at the roots of these experiences. Uh, I actually think it's important to go even further because these conditions didn't happen by accident. And uh, Dr. Ellis discusses this. She calls it inequity by design. These have actually been created by longstanding policies that are deeply embedded within our society. That's why I think we might be spelling ACE wrong. It might need to be spelled with an S as in adverse structural environments. Now, to give you a quick example of this, let's look at our hometown of Austin uh, and life expectancy by zip code, which is on this map here. Uh, now, most of the west side of Austin has higher life expectancy, indicated by darker greens, while on the east side, where our clinic is located and from where most of our patients come, uh, it's much lower, uh, lighter greens or pinks. Now, much of this stems from a series of ordinances culminating in the 1928 Master Plan of Austin, along with subsequent federal regulations, which deliberately displace communities of color to the east side. After years of policies rooted in institutional racism that limited economic opportunities, education, access to healthcare, and often created significant trauma and ACEs for individuals and communities, what you end up with is these stark variations of life expectancy. And this is what we mean when we talk about social determinants of health, that the conditions in which people live and work play a significant role in their overall health. The adage is that your zip code matters more than your genetic code. Uh, next slide, is it shifting? Oh. oh, there we go. All right, another way to look at it is the metaphor of the river. Um, now, the things that happen upstream affect health downstream. Uh, now, this is a slide from Castrucci and Auerbach, which uh, is it, important to clarify some terminology. Now, the term social determinants gets used a lot now, especially when we're talking about programs that provide prescriptions for food, vouchers for transportation, or finding housing for someone. But that's actually an incorrect use of the term. What we're actually talking about in these situations is addressing unmet individual social needs. As you can see in this slide, um, these are actually midstream interventions and are incredibly important for the individual facing that particular crisis. So we don't wanna diminish that. But if we go further upstream and look to address the conditions that created the food insecurity, lack of housing, et cetera, those are the social determinants. And improving these generally requires policy changes at local, state, or federal levels. Uh, policies lead to unaddressed individual social needs, which lead to poor health. In Fred's case, once he had his injury and lost his job, the fact that Texas did not expand Medicaid and provide a social safety net left him uninsured and in a precarious financial situation. He had a hard time paying bills, worried about housing, access to food, didn't have access to the doctors and therapies they needed, all while suffering from chronic pain. This led to a worsening of his pain, depression, and anxiety. And that doesn't even include the historical context of what BIPOC patients have faced over many years, as I just described in the previous slide. So it's not enough to just provide care in the clinic, the downstream portion. You also need to address the midstream and the upstream as well. And this requires advocacy. If we can't create, create change upstream, we're just spinning in circles downriver. And going back to Dr. Ellis's model in her Building Community Resilience Collaborative, there's an emphasis on policy change as well as building resilience within communities. That's how we work, and that's and really what is, is the essence of integrative health equity, taking a multi-level structural competency approach. So we're going to take a look at the three levels we work at. Uh, let's start with the downstream and the care we provide in the clinic where we take a holistic, culturally responsive, integrative approach. Uh, this is exemplified through our integrated pain management program, uh, which, as you can see on the right, was recently honored by the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy as one of four exemplary integrated pain programs nationwide. And your incredible comprehensive pain program here at, at University of Vermont was one of the others. Um, I've included the link if you want to learn more details about the program, including how we developed and funded it. 
Um, our IPMP aligns with best practices for pain management. We take a biopsychosocial approach, meaning we look at all factors that impact pain and use a multidisciplinary model, emphasizing evidence-based non-drug approaches to pain. Within the program, patients can pick and choose which elements they'd like to try. Uh, as one staff member called it, it's, it's like a choose your own adventure book. Uh, you can see different elements on the screen, which includes uh, behavioral health, substance use treatment, uh, our medical legal partnership, nutrition, exercise, acupuncture, and yoga therapy. All our offerings are in English and Spanish, and we strive to hire diverse practitioners and staff that reflect our patients and community to better support them. This includes our integrated practitioners where we have Black and Latinx yoga instructors and bilingual bicultural counselors and nutritionists. Uh, by doing so, there's a better understanding of the needs and resources of our patients. Um, for instance, our nutritionist recommends foods and recipes that are accessible and culturally appropriate. As an example, in order to get more omega-3s, instead of recommending salmon, which might be uh, difficult to, for a lot of our patients to afford, she might suggest making a dish with verdolagas or purslane, which is $1 at the local Fiesta grocery store and most people know how to use. Um, now, we're always thinking about how we can provide care that's more responsive to our community, and that may mean uh, even bringing in curanderas, herbalists, or other traditional healers in the future, as these are things that many of our patients tell us they value and utilize. All right, next slide. Uh, and providing culturally responsive care may be why uh, group medical visits are actually the cornerstone of the program and pull everything together. Uh, the groups are patient-driven. Uh, the group members help determine the specific topics and focus on education, self-management, and community building. Uh, there's much more time for patients to be truly heard and uh, the patient practitioner hierarchy gets flattened as the clinical staff become participants in the group. You can see a picture of Fred in the middle there uh, leading a discussion at the whiteboard and I can't overstate the importance of peer, the peer-to-peer -peer educational uh, component. Uh, patients are more likely to believe and trust someone who's lived with a chronic condition for years and has learned what helps and what doesn't. Uh, going deeper, the way we describe this program is one that supports relational health. But the understanding that unresolved complex trauma uh, and the difficulties that come with it around self-regulation -reg and attachment is often the driving force for many of our patients' symptoms. We designed a program that focuses on laying a groundwork for personal and interpersonal repair. We're not just taking into account their physical symptoms, but also their isolation, hopelessness, difficulty managing distress, and getting their needs met in relationships with others, whether that's family, friends, or even their healthcare team. The self-directed structure of the program itself, and especially the group medical visits, create multiple opportunities to try new things that may help them heal, whether those are new foods, movement, acupuncture, or simply practicing receiving care from another person, which is not a given with folks with complex trauma. As one of our social workers put it, the design of this program reflects our shared view that physical and emotional pain are not separate categories, and we can contribute to our patients' healing and our own by fortifying our sense of belonging in this community. We hope to build community, but also rebuild trust for patients in a healthcare system that may not always have treated them fairly. And we're gonna have a little more discussion about this later. But now, as we, as we mentioned before, if we truly wanna impact patients in the community's health, we can't just focus on this downstream level. We also need to work both midstream and upstream. And Keegan's gonna talk more about how we do that. So we actually developed our own social needs screening tool. We call it the people's tool. It is open source um, and it ties to various interventions that we offer in the clinic and outside the clinic through our partnerships um, with community-based organizations. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit more in just a moment about medical legal partnership, but what I wanted to, to note here is that each of these may have uh, solutions that are either exacerbated by at the structural level um, or they may be uh, much more individualized. And so we created an interventions algorithm that empowers initially our medical assistants to consider um, what we might call the acuity level of the need. Right? So this is um, an excerpt from the housing section. Some patients who screen positive for a housing need might receive information about a resource. Others might get a one pager of legal information about housing rights uh, that was created actually by our, our patient facing legal team. Others may be uh, recommended to seek assistance from a social services organization in, in town. Um, and some may actually end up with representation directly by an attorney. So again, I'll talk about the, the legal team component in a moment, but I really wanna highlight that 
we need to understand, and we have an opportunity, I think, in this moment to understand uh, health-related social needs in the larger context of this conversation about social determinants of health. Um, so we also, uh, since uh, creating this tool, partnered with Aunt Bertha, now Find Health, uh, to build an internal uh, online resource. And so you can see this um, a little bit here on the right. Um, and this helps connect patients to what they need as well. So you can plug in the patient zip code and see what resources there are, uh, are available. Um, and it spits back out a list of information that for that need uh, that are available to patients in that area. Now, the other important thing to recognize here is that we started with what we have. We had medical assistants who, as it turned out, were quite interested in being better able to address the concerns that patients were bringing to them anyway. And so with that data, the data from the paper screening tool, we were able to demonstrate a, a need for CHWs, for community health workers, and they now do this work through an online tool. So we've, we've gotten more sophisticated uh, after we demonstrated the need. We use this information also to improve clinical care. So we're moving again into the upstream portion of that graphic that, that Sherry had discussed. And that helps inform our advocacy work to improve the conditions of patients within their communities. Now, one way we do that is we try to make sure, again, that our care teams reflect patient and practitioner needs, right? That is instrumental to meeting the needs of whole people. Uh, and that means partnering with other experts. The studies are consistent. A care team that includes lawyers in particular, and I am one, uh, increases the ability of physicians to practice at the top of their license, uh, meaning they're not trying to Google things that are outside uh, the scope of their expertise. Um, it improves structural competency, right? Because we have actual expertise now as a, as a part of the team. Um, and we can do that through collaboration, through lawyer-led uh, trainings, et cetera. Uh, additionally, studies also show that physicians who perceive that their clinics have a greater capacity to address patient social needs are actually less likely to report burnout. And this makes sense, right? If, if health and medicine are not the same, then our health workforce can't just be medical providers. It's not fair that we ask uh, our clinicians and especially our physicians, I think, uh, to take on all of everything. So as was mentioned, I'm an expert in one form of multidisciplinary care that really is about bringing lawyers into, uh, into the care team. And that's why I cite studies that specifically include lawyers. Medical Legal Partnership, or MLP, is a national model. It deliberately incorporates attorneys into the delivery of healthcare. Now, at its simplest, uh, what it means is that in the same way that someone with a heart problem might be referred to a cardiologist or someone with a foot problem to a podiatrist, et cetera, someone with a socio-legal problem can be referred to a lawyer. At its best, it's so much more. It is an opportunity to transform lives through concrete interventions and to take actions that can improve the well-being of entire populations. It is an integrated approach to care that recognizes that medicine alone cannot solve problems caused by hunger or poverty. Now, I'm not the only one who thinks this. The American Medical Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Family Physicians, in addition to the American Bar Association on the, the legal side, have all passed resolutions praising medical legal partnership specifically. And I've linked to several if you're going to read one, I recommend the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, resolution because these are uh, busy folks, I think, and the AMA and the ABA have time to wax poetic. Uh, so they're much longer uh, resolutions. Now, interestingly, we're seeing this move into academics as well, especially as this evidence base grows. In September 2019, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, used to be the IOM, it's now the National Academies of Medicine, have made uh, formal recommendations that, uh, amongst other things, uh, the MLP lawyer workforce be developed and that it be studied in terms of its contribution to health. Um, this is a little bit uh, of uh, personal news, but they, they actually increased their commitment as well. Um, and in 2020, I was named the first public interest lawyer uh, to serve as an emerging leader in health and medicine, which is an annual cohort of mostly um, M MDs and PhDs who work on national health policy. So you can read more about our, our medical legal partnership at all of the links here uh, and many others uh, if you're interested in a, in a specific aspect. Um, but this will be part of the slide deck as well. 
So there is another reason to think broadly about who your coworkers are. So some of you may recall in 2014 that Chetty uh, et al, he's a health economist at Harvard, demonstrated that income inequality is predictive of health inequities. And so using substantially the same methods, um, uh, Tufel and Mace uh, in particular, there were some others, uh, found that inequities in legal services were actually as or more predictive of community health and income inequality, right? Inequities in legal services are as or more predictive of community health than income inequality. Access to counsel matters, as it turns out. And there's uh, several reasons for the correlation. Um, but the, really the most important takeaway is that by considering the role of law, by considering the role of lawyers, we can change tales of the way things are to concrete solvable problems. And the other way that legal services are concrete um, is our concrete approach to social determinants of health, which a lot of times is a really squishy concept, is that the action leads to a quantifiable benefit that impacts health and healthcare. So we have a mnemonic uh, in this field, it's I help, it's nice and cheery. Um, and it gives us a little bit of a framework for thinking through the ways that law uh, impacts health and the way that we can understand legal interventions uh, as a mechanism for resolving um, health-related social needs. So the I stands for income and insurance. The idea here is that wealth is the greatest predictor of health um, alongside access to counsel. And so ensuring access to legal programs that increase financial stability is very important. The H stands for housing and utilities. And if you think about how uh, in September 2020, about you know, six months into the pandemic, we saw the CDC issue a moratorium on evictions, right? Because housing and health matter. Um, homelessness prevention matters, but there are other ways that law has structured a response to try to keep people healthy. Uh, things like uh, requirements around clean, run uh, clean running water, uh, which we actually don't have in this moment in Austin, <laughs> um, keeping the walls mold free, uh, et cetera. The E stands for education and employment. Now, both of these have a bi-directional relationship with health. Good health is necessary for success at school and at work. And yet at the same time, without educational attainment, it's very hard to have the kind of job that provides the financial resources uh, that, uh, and insurance uh, that are necessary to access the medical care. It's also hard to be a good patient if you don't have a solid education. The L stands for legal status. And the idea here is that the way that government defines us does not always map onto the way that we define ourselves. And when those don't match, it's hard to access the medical system and other spaces of opportunity. Uh, we're actually at increased risk of disease, illness, and even physical and sexual assault as a result. And finally, the P stands for personal and familial stability. Uh, it's really a reminder of the importance of a stable home life and social network and living our best lives. Now, this very concrete approach creates measurable outcomes because public interest lawyers keep tons of data. Um, that's a little bit of a conversation for another day, but again, I, but I wanna highlight um, the, the uh, tangible aspects of uh, this approach to social determinants of health. An integrative and holistic approach to health and healthcare um, also means, and specifically having the kind of legal toolkit also means that we don't have to address health-related social needs on an individual level. Uh, recall the graphic that Sherrod uh, mentioned um, that suggests this is midstream response. Really important, but um, but it's not the only thing we can do once we put a, a lawyer on the healthcare team. Uh, that gives us an additional set of tools, an additional set of expertise that allow us to move seamlessly from patients to policy. And MLP lawyers can help at multiple levels. So first, um, thinking about clinical practices, procedures, pathways, and policies. There's ways that law shapes patient health, and those can be incorporated uh, such that notions of health equity are used to transform uh, clinical practice. So to give you an example, um, under the law, teenagers become their own decision makers, um, and it's a function of law. It's usually at age 18, 
uh, in most states. This change in status to a legal adult uh, necessarily affects uh, access to care. And yet it can also be used to ease the transition in a way um, from adolescent medicine or pediatrics to adult medicine in a way that, that helps us not lose patients, right, within the healthcare system because this system suddenly got complicated uh, just because of that 18th birthday. So we can build that into our clinical policies. Now, second um, way is that lawyers are skilled problem solvers. We are trained to spot issues. And so when, for example, a patient reports concerns in the community that's maybe led them to cancel appointments, which is uh, bad for the patients, bad for their family, it's also bad for keeping the lights on, quite frankly. Um, an MLP attorney may be particularly adept at helping to educate patients and providers about what's, what, what those changes in law may be, um, that, and they may otherwise seem irrelevant. So to give you an example, in 2018, we saw a change in immigration law. And uh, what we saw on the ground in the clinic was an increase in patient no-shows and, and, and canceled appointments. Uh, and we also saw an increase in the number of parents who were disenrolling their children from Medicaid, which is a, already a very limited program in Texas. And so through our medical legal partnership lens, we were able to create a clinical policy uh, to in, uh, increase patient safety while also mitigating risk to the clinic. We worked with other organizations to educate community members about why kiddos were actually fine using public benefits, including Medicaid. Now, there is another set of stakeholders in this work uh, managed care organizations, and they benefit too from activities like this because it mitigates churn in the Medicaid system. Um, and then that way, I think it begins to create a model, um, a very tangible model for value-based care and value-based payment. So third, healthcare providers are often asked to testify before legislative bodies, but uh, so too are lawyers. And MLP lawyers in particular are adept at addressing health policy and that legal language that, that may be um, meaningful uh, to legislatures. Um, but the scope, oops, I'm scrolling ahead. <laughs> but the scope of practice um, means that an MLP lawyer also has access to the legal system and its tools. And that can uh, mean that partnering with healthcare providers uh, gives voice to, to, to physicians, to clinicians, uh, and to patients who have um, give voice to them in spaces they may not otherwise uh, have uh, access to. So an example, uh, very early in the pandemic, we had this really practical problem that patients who could not pay their electric, electric bills or water bills because perhaps they'd lost their job um, were um, uh, having their utilities turned off, right? Because they're having to quarantine, they're having to isolate. Um, makes it really difficult to stay at home, makes it really difficult to wash your hands. But because of our MLP relationships, we were able to quickly organize uh, a coalition of legal experts and medical experts to draft a petition for emergency rulemaking on utility protections. So this is an extremely technical approach uh, to what is fundamentally a health problem. Now, when that program had ended, um, over 1 million Texans had access to running water to wash their hands, they had access to electricity to help them stay home, and they would not have had that in the absence of action at the structural level. Now, that $30 million plus dollar project um, also uh, not only took care of individuals and families, um, but it also helped stabilize the market, actually, and that protects vulnerable and non-vulnerable populations alike. And finally, of course, our MLP lawyers are part of our judicial branch. Our MLP, as a, as a final example, proffered a friend of the court brief um, that formally presented to our nation's highest court, to the federal Supreme Court, these real life stories from patients and from providers with boots on the ground. So again, we're giving voice to patients, uh, to clinicians in spaces that they may not generally be heard, um, and in particular to, uh, to providers with their boots on the ground. And that may or may not be reflected in professional association efforts. I've also given you uh, links to, uh, to read more about each of these. So, but what all of these have in common is that a structural and equity-minded approach means that we are using law uh, not just to equalize uh, health opportunities. Rather, by recognizing the connections between health, healthcare, and law, we can create actual equity. 
And most significantly, we can advocate for entire barriers to be removed in a way that improves the lives of individuals and communities. All right, and so we're gonna close with a couple, just a couple things. Um, so <clears throat> as we previously discussed, um, many of our patients in the program are incredibly complex, have experienced trauma and have uh, unmet social needs. Uh, so this is too much for one practitioner to address on their own. And that's kind of what we've been talking about. Like we, having, having a team really helps uh, with some of these things that might be out of your scope. Uh, so the way we coordinate the care we provide for these patients is through regular case conferences. Now, these used to be weekly in person, but with the pandemic, have switched to virtual meetings every other week. Now, this photo is an example of one we've held in the IPMP, but we're work working to expand these into other areas of the clinic because we find that's super valuable. Uh, all of the practitioners within the IPMP come to, come to these. We're hoping in the future to be able to include community health workers uh, as well. And oftentimes some of the first things that we do uh, in these conferences are to stabilize crises and address social needs. So our MLP and social workers, and hopefully soon the community health workers would be key to that discussion. Uh, but it's incredibly enlightening to also get perspectives of the acupuncturist and the yoga therapist or the nutritionist there. Uh, and often overlooked part when discussing uh, DEI initiatives at diversity, equity, and, and inclusion, especially within interprofessional teams, is how you create more equitable workspaces which aren't dominated by MDs. Uh, these case conferences go a long way to help with this as well, um, as, because like as the group uh, medical visits flatten hierarchies within patient, uh, between patients and practitioners, these meetings do the same within our healthcare team. Uh, everyone has their own knowledge and lived experiences that they bring to the table, and we learn from each other. Uh, when more people are comfortable sharing their opinions, you're less likely to miss something, and overall this improves patient care. Uh, it also improves pac practitioner satisfaction and mitigates burnout, as, as Keegan mentioned in, in her slide. Um, no one person has to do it all since we all work together to figure out what exactly our patients need, and we've had practitioners say that this is their favorite part of the week uh, coming to these case conferences. All right, so I wanna kind of close with a little bit of evaluation um, and what we've learned from this approach to care. Um, now the IPMP is still pretty young uh, and we're in the process of collecting and analyzing data, uh, but we've run into challenges around this given our resources and staffing. Um, plus it's pretty hard to truly evaluate pain because it's so complex and based on the nature of our program, each patient has an individualized treatment approach. Um, we have uh, currently over 160 patients enrolled in our program. Uh, the most popular services are behavioral health and acupuncture. Uh, the metrics we aim to look at and, uh, and which we, we're collecting are around pain and functioning, behavioral health and physical health, opioid usage, and ER utilization. But really, the ultimate goal uh, is to improve the quality of life. And we're piloting a tool called the Flourishing Measures, uh, which you can see on the right there, which is from Harvard. Uh, and we, along with many others, uh, and as we mentioned earlier, in, in the big breakout groups are starting to move from what's the matter with you to what matters to you? As I think someone mentioned, you know, thinking about what Fred's uh, interests are, what, they, what he wants out of this. Uh, and honestly, patients don't necessarily care about their scores on these metrics I just mentioned. They, they care whether they can get back to doing the things that they love. So that's what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, and that's where the qualitative data can be really valuable. And, and Keegan mentioned the importance of, of stories. Um, and we had an amazing medical student spend her third year researching our program. Uh, she interviewed patients who participated in the IPMP and asked them whether their quality of life improved. Uh, it was a pretty small sample size, there was an N of nine, but it did yield some important results. And what she found was four major themes that emerged, uh, which are listed. Uh, the first one is that pain is a persistent and challenging reality. If you have chronic pain, you're, you're likely going to hurt regardless of what you do. So it isn't about eliminating pain completely, but more about what you can do to help manage it so you're better able to live your life. Now, the second one is very important and fits into what we know uh, for patients of color who live with chronic pain. Many have had numerous negative encounters in the healthcare system, and as a result, may feel distrustful or hopeless when they have to engage with it. They often feel unseen or unheard, experience prejudicial treatment, and sometimes feel like they're treated as though they were drug addicts. Um, this happened not just in the ERs or pain specialist offices, um, but even with our primary care uh, physicians at our clinic. Um, and this opened our eyes a bit. Um, while part of our mission describes providing care with dignity and respect, we obviously aren't always living up to our values. It speaks to the need as an organization and individually as, uh, individually as practitioners and staff to look at our implicit biases and how it impacts our patients and their health. Um, our goal is to create what's called a culturally safe space where patients feel comfortable with their interactions with staff and feel that they'll be heard and believed. 
And that's on us. So there's some work to do. And as a start, we've begun holding uh, racism in medicine and implicit bias trainings for practitioners and staff. Uh, additionally, we have a DEI consulting, uh, actually this week, uh, starting to hold workshops with staff to develop a longer term plan on how to make the clinic a more inclusive and equitable organization. Um, but this study also, uh, also suggested that there are some things that we're already doing within the program that can be effective to combat this. Now, practitioners who use active listening, empathy, and action-oriented plans were seen in most, as most trustworthy and caring. The program affords more time to building therapeutic alliances with multiple providers whether it's a doctor, social worker, nutritionist, acupuncturist, yoga therapist, or lawyer. Patients reported feeling heard and validated, especially in group medical visits, which as we previously discussed, work to disrupt the traditional hierarchical model of healthcare. Uh, as a result, patients were more likely to trust their healthcare team and the suggestions that they offered. And then this ties in the last two themes, that connecting with other people and learning the coping skills to be able to manage their own health were essential to improving quality of life. Uh, integration of all these pieces was valuable as well. I mean, we basically created a one-stop shop where people can have their, many of their needs met, physical, emotional, social, which differs from the typical experience of siloed care. Patients that participated in uh, behavioral health and counseling in groups had better outcomes. Counseling offered patients the opportunity to process past traumas, challenge fixed beliefs and behaviors, and overcome hesitation to speak with others about the stresses and difficulties of living with chronic pain. In groups, patients felt understood by others, felt belonging among others living with pain, and felt empowered to try new ways to manage their pain. Now, overall, patients who participated in counseling in groups endorsed an increased positive outlook on life, um, decreased, uh, sorry, increased emotional well-being, increased willingness to try new things, decreased sense of stigmatization, stigmatization and a decreased sense of social isolation. Uh, social, so, sorry, social isolation. Um, the program improved self-efficacy, which is the individual's belief in their capacity to manage their health, as well as self-advocacy, which is essentially representing their own interests within the healthcare uh, system or healthcare decision making, which is really important in historically marginalized populations who are often treated poorly in the healthcare system. Uh, now, while our program and this particular study was focused on chronic pain, as we've discussed, this is really a program that addresses complex trauma. Therefore, our belief is that this could apply to any chronic condition, and our goal is to expand this model to help transform care. So let's return to Fred and how the different levels of care our clinic provides applied to him. So from the downstream perspective, you know, Fred was a very active part of the IPMP. He participated in various aspects of the program, including groups, counseling, acupuncture, and more. This program helped him gain skills to help manage his pain on a day-to-day -day basis and improve his quality of life. Fred, who, as we know, is a minister, summed up the program by saying, instead of giving us a fish, you're teaching us to fish. In terms of addressing individual social needs, uh, his insurance wasn't covering his MRI, so he wasn't able to get the care that he needed. So as a result, the MLP legal team appealed that non-coverage decision and got it approved. Um, we also helped him apply for uh, disability, and that got him both Medicare and Medicaid, giving him access to more services uh, and treatments. On a policy level, Fred, like me, is a member of the board of directors. Um, he's actually our board chair, in fact. After all, who's better to help the clinic meet its requirements under federal law? And more importantly, this allows him to advocate within our organization to increase uh, access to these types of integrative services. And recently, in fact, he went to Washington, D.C. to share a story and to advocate on behalf of FQs on Capitol Hill, thus potentially impacting the policymakers who set the rules. And we recognize that this singular example does not encompass all tenets of health equity, it's a, which is a decades old discipline uh, with a rich evidence base. Instead, we focused on a discrete set of interventions within the delivery of healthcare. It is critical that in undertaking efforts to fold in health equity and health justice, we neither pollute the waters with perfunctory efforts nor dilute the research base because of unchecked biases. We don't assert that our approach is perfect, but we do hope it is clear that we do not mean to be tourists in this work, and I implore you not to be either. Uh, but we, we do hope this provides a bit of insight into what is possible if we expand our definition of integrative health and what it could be capable of if we work on multiple levels and address true root causes. Um, there's so much potential to improve the quality of life for our patients, our community, and our nation. Um, Thank you so much for this opportunity to present. And I know we're 
basically out of time, but we were happy to hang out for a few minutes and answer questions if people want. Thank you so much. Hi, good morning. Um, I have a question. How typically is um, the legal counsel, um, I guess, financed um, within a practice? Yeah, this is a great question on one we get um, frequently. There are numerous ways uh, to finance uh, a, a legal team as part of part of your healthcare team. So it depends a little bit on what entity you are and then how and what the entity is on the legal side as well. We have piloted um, about a half dozen of these programs through legal fellowships. So we're focusing on the, the legal uh, funding within the, the legal community. And we use that to demonstrate um, or to predict, frankly, ROI uh, for, for healthcare team investment. So in an FQ, um, in fact, including in People's Community Clinic, HRSA designated legal services uh, as case management services and as enabling services. So in other words, you can use HRSA dollars. Um, if you're in a host, if you're a nonprofit hospital, you are able to uh, use your community benefit dollars or your community, your CHNA um, funding. If you are an MCO uh, looking at this, you can think in terms of outreach and enrollment. Um, Etc. So there's actually a numerous um, funding streams. Of course, there's always philanthropy, right? Um, but there are numerous funding streams that are baked into uh, into government, um, and I think demonstrate an increasing willingness and comfort with investing at the structural level uh, as part of our healthcare teams. We have a lot of people here saying great talk, awesome talk, and they're so inspiring. You know, thank yous from many, including you know, John Porter from our director at our comprehensive pain program here. Um, was really um, very good, so comprehensive. And I, I had never really thought about integrating uh, a lawyer or legal um, professional into our medical, basically into our medical home or into our institution for our medical homes. And um, it just makes so much sense. And having someone maybe who's actually dedicated to helping with policy change um, is, would be incredibly useful. I, I love this idea and the model. And I, I honestly don't know where our institution is on that. There's probably stuff going on already that I have no idea about because that's how it usually goes. But, um, but I really appreciated the information and the talk. So thank you so much both for being here. Thank you for having us. Hey, you're welcome. All right, I'm gonna log off. I need to get to my uh, morning clinic. So thank you so much. Bye, Kara. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody. Thank you so much, Sherry. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Bye. Bye. And just um, while I still have you, it's it's um, cool to post on our website the recording and awesome. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Completely.